Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. For those who are new to the channel, this is the channel where I cover two of my most favorite hobbies, that is statue and figure collecting and reef keeping. Today we're going to go over the three most popular methods to provide alkalinity and calcium to the reef aquarium. Over the years, I've tried all top three methods and I'm currently using a calcium reactor on my main display tank. I've gotten the reactor dialed in and things are going fairly smooth. First, before we begin, please remember to hit that like button. It really helps out the channel and consider subscribing to the channel. Now, there were some challenges in the beginning of setting up a calcium reactor and I'll go over that in a bit during this video, but I'm hoping to make it easier for those who are considered transitioning from calcwasser or two-part dosing to the calcium reactor. When I first got into the hobby, I started off using calcwasser. I like this idea because it was relatively cheap. For about 500 grams of the Seachem Calcwasser, I only paid about $14 for it. It's basically calcium hydroxide and it takes about six grams, which is approximately two teaspoons of it to make one gallon of a Calcwasser solution. So you just mix this stuff up and drip it inside of your tank as the solution. Calcwasser is used to add a balanced amount of calcium and alkalinity to your reef tank. I currently also use it to help control my pH because I'm using a calcium reactor which tends to drop the pH, but I'll talk about that in a little bit later in the video. Now, some hobbyists use calcwasser in their ATO and whenever their ATO provides water to the tank, it would just bring along some calcwasser. Personally, I didn't like the idea of how much calcwasser that was going to go into my tank was dependent on my evaporation rate inside of my tank. The amount of water removed from my tank at any given time could also be affected by an error, such as water that's not actually evaporating but is somehow leaving my tank through other means. So I was concerned that this left too much room for error by using the calc washer inside of the ATO. So there were just too many variables for me to think about as far as relying on calc, uh, calc washer being delivered through the ATO system. I know many use this system without difficulty, but I just wanted a method that would make me sleep a little bit better at night and allow me to have a little bit more control of the amount of calc washer that would go inside of my tank. I decided to use a Tom's Aqualifter instead. I really like the idea of the Tom's Aqualifter since it has so many uses, but my first use of it was for dosing calc washer into my tank. I would mix up a solution of the calc washer and put it into a dosing container and I had the apex control the aqua lifter. So I had an oscillating schedule where the apex would turn on the aqua lifter about every hour or so for about 10 seconds and it would squirt some of the calc washer into the sump of the tank. This worked for me for about two years. I decided to move on to two part dosing after I became tired of the precipitation from the calc washer building up in my sump. There would be a white film of precipitant that formed on all of my equipment in the area that the cock washer was dripping into. So I decided to just move on. However, I continued to use the aqua lifter for other applications since it is so useful. I also used it to start a siphon on my hang on the back drain for my BioCube Nano Reef Tank, which also had a sump. So all I did was to start a siphon was to hook up that aqualifter to it and it would help me start the siphon. I also used the aqualifter to suck out some water in hard to reach areas or difficult areas to remove water from in the tank due to the gravity not working in my favor since the sump water is at a low level to begin with. In these cases I just hooked up the aqualifter and had the water sucked out of an area of the sump or container that is hard to siphon from otherwise. So I moved on to the two-part dosing. Now, this is the method I used to provide alkalinity and calcium to my tank up until about two months ago when I switched to the calcium reactor. Overall, I was very satisfied with using two-part. For the most part, it worked very well, but remembering to refill the alkalinity and calcium containers began to wear on me over time. Even though the system worked well and kept things relatively stable as far as the calcium and alkalinity were concerned, I always felt that my tank could have been possibly more stable and occasionally I would forget to top off the calcium and alkalinity at times. There would be, you know, 
a swing in my alkalinity and calcium level as a result of me forgetting to top it off. On the other hand, I enjoyed the fact that all I had to do every several days or so was top off the alkalinity and calcium containers and have the Neptune Apex dose system to dose the alkalinity and calcium to my tank. I also liked the amount of control that I had when using the dose system, which at the time of it making this video runs about 300 bucks. Since Coral tends to use less alkalinity during the night, I had the dose system to just add less alkalinity at night for more stable parameters. The two part I used was ESV Bionic. ESV two part calcium buffer system generally comes in two containers. There's one for alkalinity and there's one for calcium. You usually have to mix these two solutions separately before topping off your dosing containers. This idea is also something that led me to think of using a calcium reactor more. Although I had to do it occasionally, mixing up the solution was getting kind of old for me after a while, especially since I used the eight gallon buffering system, which costs around 90 bucks. In the eight gallon system, you have four gallons of alkalinity to mix up and four gallons of the calcium. They each come in these five gallon buckets. This will last me for months. However, due to the COVID situation, I ran into an issue where it was more difficult for me to find the five gallon buckets of the two part and the smaller sizes such as 64 ounces uh, of the two part system just wasn't making any financial sense to me. Therefore, I was seduced more to the idea of starting up a calcium reactor. My system at the time I was using the dose was using about 100 milliliters of alkalinity per day and about 80 milliliters of the calcium. Again, the Apex dose system runs about $300. So the cost of the system was really mostly determined by the two-part solution that I had to purchase every few months. The bottom line was that I was actually satisfied with the system until I made an error with it. And that pretty much drove me to consider a calcium reactor a bit more. I mistakenly poured some calcium into the alkalinity container and quickly walked away without noticing that a precipitation was building up after I poured the calcium into the alkalinity. I ended up getting very busy for the next couple of days or so, and it really, I really didn't pay attention uh, to my reef tank as much as I should have. And I missed that my alkalinity had significantly dropped inside of my reef tank. So that was all I needed to try my attempt at satisfying my curiosity Finally, with the, uh, with the calcium reactor. Now, the startup cost of a calcium reactor is much more than uh, Kalkwasser in two part. Probably at least a thousand dollars more. I'll talk about that in a little bit more. But first, let's understand what a calcium reactor is exactly. A calcium reactor is essentially a chamber where a chemical reaction occurs that allows calcium reactor media to dissolve in water. It is used to provide calcium and alkalinity to the reef tank in addition to some trace elements. The idea behind a calcium reactor is using calcium reactor media, which is old coral skeleton, to provide alkalinity, calcium, and other trace elements that are beneficial to the coral for growth and thriving inside of our reef aquariums. This is based on the thought that the coral skeletons that we use in the media were once living corals that required the same substances that we are trying to provide to our coral to thrive and grow inside of our aquarium. In order to release all of these beneficial substances, the media must be dissolved. We dissolve that media with the carbon dioxide or the CO2. To provide CO2, we need a CO2 tank. You can pick up a CO2 tank from a local brewery, a welding shop, or aquariumplants.com. At aquariumplants.com, you can buy a CO2 regulator or the carbon dosa. You can also get a CO2 tank at a discount when you purchase the carbon dosa. A CO2 tank filled with CO2 is going to run you about $110. It would cost about another $20 or $22 to refill the CO2 tank when it runs out, but this shouldn't have to be done more than once or twice per year. To understand basically what occurs inside of a calcium reactor, 
it is useful to just look at CO2 as an acid. It's not really an acid, but the chemical reaction it produces inside of a calcium reactor produces an acid. And therefore, when trying to understand the setup, it is just easier to just look at CO2 as an acid. Essentially, the carbon doser injects acid into the calcium reactor if you look at CO2 as an acid. This is because once CO2 gets inside of the reactor, it reacts with the water inside of the calcium reactor and the calcium carbonate, which is a part of the dead coral skeleton or reactor media, to produce calcium and carbonic acid. In other words, injecting CO2 inside of a calcium reactor makes the calcium carbonate skeleton from the reactor media to become more soluble in water. Now, keep in mind that CO2 can potentially be delivered to your reef tank and if the pH gets too low there, it can make it difficult for corals to build upon their already existing skeleton because a similar reaction that occurs inside of a calcium reactor can potentially start occurring in your reef tank if the pH drops too low inside of your display tank. Therefore, the amount of CO2 that is delivered to the calcium reactor must be regulated. This is where the CO2 regulator, or the carbon doser, comes in. The carbon doser runs about $390. Again, this is essentially to control how much CO2 is going to be delivered to the reactor or how much acid will go inside of the calcium reactor if you are looking at CO2 as if it's an acid. There are five parts to the carbon doser. The first part is the high pressure gauge. This is the gauge that is on the left side. This gauge shows the amount of pressure that is inside of the CO2 tank. The second part is the low pressure gauge. This is the gauge that is on top of the tank and it shows the pressure at which you will actually be delivering the CO2 inside of the calcium reactor. This is going to control the size of your bubble inside of your bubble counter on your calcium reactor. We'll go over the bubble counter in just a bit. The third part is the little black box. This will allow you to control your bubble count. You can use the dial on the black box to adjust the amount of seconds per bubble. In other words, the dial on the black box will allow you to control how many seconds that elapse before another bubble is injected inside of the calcium reactor. The fourth part is the pressure safety relief. This is to the right of the low pressure gauge. This protects the carbon doser if the pressure is set higher than 40 pounds. And last but not least is the fifth part, which is the pressure knob. This knob is used to adjust the pressure that will control the amount of CO2 being delivered to the calcium reactor. This is generally set from zero to 15 pounds. For my specific calcium reactor, the Vario CR140, I have it set to about five. The calcium reactor is only able to handle so much pressure inside of its chamber, therefore you have to be careful with how you set the pressure knob. By the way, the Vario CR140 runs about 560 bucks. Now, initially I was reluctant to try a calcium reactor. I already attached so many moving parts onto my aquarium system, so I didn't really want to have to deal with extra equipment that would fail. I looked at the calcium reactor as a Ruby Goldberg type of setup, and this initially was kind of intimidating to me. So I figured that a calcium reactor was too many moving parts that would be on my tank, and I would be constantly be working to deal with failing parts. However, after I had it all tuned in, I found it to actually be quite easy and you really don't have to fiddle around much with it after you have it tuned in. There are four parts to the calcium reactor system and we already discussed two of them. So the first part is the calcium reactor itself. The second part is the, cal uh, the carbon doser and the third part is the CO2 tank and the fourth part is the feed pump. We already discussed the CO2 tank and the carbon doser. Now we will discuss the calcium reactor in a bit more depth. The calcium reactor at its most basic concept 
It is essentially a cylinder in which you place calcium reactor media inside of to take part in of a chemical reaction. I like it since it was a twist top and it, it's not a whole bunch of thumb screws at the top of it to manipulate just to open the lid. The media I use is Reborn by Two Little Fishies. This runs about $40 for a 8.8 pound bag, which should last you several months depending on your demand for your specific reef tank. My tank is about 150 gallons and I now have had my calcium reactor running for about two months and I don't think even one third of the media has dissolved. So generally this can potentially last from six months to almost a year at the rate of this consumption. So as a part of the CR140, you have a DC pump to circulate the water inside of the calcium reactor. Now, this was the issue I initially had when I first set up my uh, calcium reactor, and I'll go over that in a little bit, but all the difficulties I had with dialing in my calcium reactor initially was related to the recirculation pump. It was not the pump's fault. I just didn't understand how it was used for, uh, you know, very well in relation to the calcium reactor. There's also a valve on the side of the varios, which is related to how the recirculation pump circulates water inside of the reactor. You also have the bubble counter, which provides visualization of the amount of CO2 that is going inside of the reactor. With the carbon doser, I found it not to be so crucial to follow the amount of bubbles since there will be a set amount of CO2 being injected inside of the reactor when you use the carbon doser. Again, the goal is to get the pH low enough, which is generally between 6.5 to 6.8 to dissolve the media. You don't want to set the pH below 6.5 since this can dissolve your media too rapidly and turn it into a muddy type of substance that's not going to be very useful to you. So as the media dissolves, alkalinity, calcium, and other trace elements are released from the media and is available for consumption by your coral. In order to tune the calcium reactor to the point where it delivers a stable amount of alkalinity and calcium to the tank, you must monitor the pH inside of the calcium reactor. Most calcium reactors have a hole or a port at the top of the lid that accepts a pH probe. I use a Neptune Apex pH probe, which came with my Neptune Apex controller. The probe alone runs about $75. Now, the, next, the Neptune Apex L, which comes with the temperature probe and a pH probe, runs about $500 and the full Neptune Apex runs about $800, and it comes with a pH probe, a temperature probe, ORP probe, and a selenium probe. You can also use a standalone pH probe with a controller such as the Milwaukee pH monitor. It comes with the pH probe and pH controller, and this is going to run about $130. Personally, I prefer to use the, Na uh, the Neptune Apex pH probe, this is a big advantage to me because I can use the Neptune Apex to control my carbon doser. For example, I currently have the power adapter for my carbon doser plugged into my Neptune Apex energy bar. Now, with some programming, I was allowed to control the carbon doser. I programmed the Apex to turn on my carbon doser, and when my pH is less than 6.6, .6, I also programmed it to turn off the carbon doser if the pH inside of my tank is less than 7.75. This is to prevent the pH from dropping too low inside of my tank, which will hinder the coral from building new skeleton. So the Neptune Apex allows easier controlling of my calcium reactor setup by controlling the carbon doser. So if my alkalinity inside of my tank drop, I simply change the parameters for turning on and off the carbon doser. For example, if I want to keep my alkalinity at 9, but it drops to 8.5, I will pro program my Neptune Apex to turn on the carbon doser at a lower pH than 6.6, .6, which will allow the carbon doser to transfer more, more CO2 to the calcium reactor, which will dissolve more media and therefore release more alkalinity to be transferred to my tank. 
In other words, if my alkalinity is dropping too low, I set the pH inside of the calcium reactor to be even lower, which would dissolve more media. This can also be used for the opposite situation as well. If the pH is too high, I can simply program the apex to turn off the carbon doser at 6.8 instead of 6.7. This will dissolve less media since the water will be less acidic and therefore less alkalinity and calcium will be released into the tank. You can also control the amount of alkalinity and calcium that is delivered to the display tank from the calcium reactor with the feed pump. There are actually two methods to delivering the effluent from the calcium reactor to your tank. The push and the pour methods. Initially, I used the push method with the use of the Mighty Jet return pump. This pump runs about 110 bucks. Basically, this is a DC pump which, uh, with the controller. So you will place this inside of your sump, connect the hose to the pump, and then run it to your calcium reactor. There are different ways you can connect the tubing to the pump, but I used a John Guest push fit faucet connector that came with my RODI system. I used the Mighty Jet to push water through the calcium reactor. It came out through a John Guest opening at the top through the tubing that eventually delivered the alkalinity and calcium solution to the tank or the affluent. Now, it is important when using this setup to use a precision needle valve so that you can make precise adjustments in the amount of effluent that is delivered to your tank. I used a 1 4th Hayward needle valve that I picked up from BRS for about 63 bucks. However, there are much cheaper options that are about as effective that runs about $25 or less. I initially tried using the cheapest option for a John Guest valve, however, this did not work out well for me. It was very difficult to make precise adjustments, so this made it difficult to prevent large fluctuations in my parameters. The precision needle valve allows you to make the small adjustments you may need to control the amount of alkalinity and calcium or effluent being delivered to your tank and also the pH inside of your tank. The other method is the pour method. With this method, instead of using a pump like the Mighty Jet to push water into the calcium reactor, you use a dosing pump to pour water through the calcium reactor from the effluent line side of the calcium reactor. This is the method I prefer and the one I'm currently using on my calcium reactor. I prefer using the pull method because I find it easier to tune the calcium reactor. I think it's easier to control things from the fluent side in general. I use the Camor pump to pour water from my sump and through the calcium reactor. The Camor pump runs about $300. It is a continuous duty pump, which means that it runs 24 hours, seven days a week to deliver the effluent from your calcium reactor to your tank. All you have to do is plug it in and you can use the dial on the front of the pump to control the flow rate or you can use the cell phone app to control the flow rate. That makes it very easy when it comes to tuning your calcium reactor. For example, when I initially set up the Komora pump, I programmed it for 50 milliliters per minute. With my Apex program to control my carbon doser to keep the pH inside of my calcium reactor between 6.5 to 6.7, my alkalinity inside of my tank was running to about 9.5 at these settings. This was about five tenths of a point higher than I wanted my alkalinity inside of my tank. I wanted my alkalinity at nine, not 9.5. I simply adjusted the flow rate through the Camora pump using the app from 50 milliliters per minute to 40 milliliters per minute. Subsequently, this decreased my alkalinity down to about 9.2, which was still a bit higher than my goal. So I waited for another 24 hours to make another adjustment to the reactor setup in order to further decrease my alkalinity inside of my tank. I programmed the Neptune Apex to control the carbon doser so that the pH inside of the calcium reactor is maintained between 6.6 .6 to 6.8 instead of 6.5 to 6.7. 
These adjustments were all I needed to reach my target of around nine. With these adjustments and using the controller, I did not have to mess around with the carbon doser, including the bubble rate to make the appropriate adjustments so that I can achieve stable alkalinity and calcium in my desired range. This is why I strongly recommend that a quarium controller be used to maintain the pH inside of the reactor through the carbon doser and to control the pH probe. An alternative adjustment could have been made by using the, the dial on the little black box to control the bubble rate. For example, if the alkalinity is lower than you would like, such as, at, uh, such as being 8 when you prefer 9, simply decrease the amount of seconds between each bubble that is produced by the carbon doser by turning the dial from 4 to 3. On the other hand, if you are at 9 and would prefer your alkalinity to be at 8, you simply increase the amount of seconds between each bubble, therefore lowering the bubble rate, which would cause CO2 to, become, uh, to be injected into the calcium reactor less frequently, and therefore less media will be dissolved, which means less alkalinity and calcium being released through the influent. Once you set the pressure for the low pressure gauge, you should not need to adjust it any further. For example, again, mine is set at five and stayed there throughout my entire tuning process and it is still located at five now. To tune in the calcium reactor using the Camor pump, I only had to make two adjustments in order to tune my calcium reactor. When you tune your calcium reactor, it is very important to resist temptation to constantly fiddle with the setup. Just fight that feeling. This is because it can take several hours to up to 24 hours for a calcium reactor to, to adjust to the changes that you make. Therefore, you want to ex exercise a lot of patience when you make an adjustment. Don't worry about your coral or your fish being harmed by the small changes that you are making every 24 hours. You should check your alkalinity and calcium levels about every 24 hours and you should check them around the same time each day. This is a much easier process with an automated tester such as the Neptune Trident. The Neptune Trident can be programmed to check your alkalinity four times a day and your calcium and magnesium twice per day. You can also check these parameters more frequently if you like. The Neptune Trident runs about $600 in a packet of reagents for the calcium, magnesium, and alkalinity readings run about $45 for a two-month supply and about $100 for a six-month supply. I found this to be a much more desirable option for testing my parameters when trying to tune my calcium reactor. All I had to do was sit back and wait for scheduled parameters readings through the Trident and then I can make my adjustments for my calcium reactor if needed. Now the downside to the calcium reactor that is tends to drop the pH inside of the tank. As stated earlier, a higher pH is needed for coral growth. This makes sense from the standpoint that we are actually using a low pH environment inside of a calcium reactor to dissolve dead coral skeleton. Therefore, a higher pH will tend to be conducive to building new coral skeleton. To combat the lowering of my pH inside of my tank, I use two methods. The first method is a CO2 scrubber. A CO2 scrubber is basically a reactor chamber that you place color changing CO2 absorbent media inside to absorb some of the CO2 that is being released inside of your tank through the effluent. A CO2 scrubber comes in different sizes ranging from a smaller size that costs about 30 to 40 bucks and holds about one pound of media to a larger size that will run about 120 to 140 dollars and holds about four pounds of media. I picked up a smaller CO2 scrubber from BRS for about 35 bucks. It's probably a little bit too small for my 150 gallon tank, but my sump is pretty full, so I needed something small enough to fit inside of my sump, and therefore I had to go with uh, something on the smaller side. Now, I find this quite effective since it's able to raise my pH about one tenth to two tenths of a point, but not as efficient. The downside is it only lasts for about a week. 
If I were to use a larger CO2 scrubber, I probably wouldn't have to change the CO2 media out as often. However, there's still the cost of the media itself. A single 1.2 pound cartridge refill runs about $6.50 at BRS. So this is about $25 or so per month to prevent my pH from dropping inside of my tank. This is why I plan to fully move from using a CO2 scrubber to only using Kalkwasser to raise the pH. So it has come f full circle now. It comes back to the Kalkwasser after some years of abandoning it. So I can't totally get away from the Kalkwasser, but it's okay. It's a useful solution. All you have to do is take two teaspoons of the Kalkwasser powder and place it into one gallon of RODI water. I use my old ESV bionic jugs to mix the solution and label it appropriately. I then place it in a container and have the Versa pump transfer the calc washer from the container and deliver it to my sump in the area in a continuous duty fashion. The Versa pump runs at about $150. It also is controlled through an app called Mobius. I have it set at about 0.28 milliliters per minute and to deliver a maximum of about 400 milliliter, uh, milliliters per day. The calc washer along with the CO2 scrubber keeps my pH at about 8.0 to 8.2, which I can live with and I'm sure my coral can as well. Well, there you have it. This is how I transition from calc washer as my main delivery of alkalinity and calcium to my system to a calcium reactor. Overall, I'm very pleased with the calcium reactor. My parameters have been very stable since getting it tuned in, and I really haven't had to worry about it much. It is truly seems to be set and forget. This is unlike when I was using two-part system, which I would have to remember at least every several days to make sure I was topping it off in time. If I had enough room under my sump, uh, I could have used bigger containers for my two-part system, so... I didn't have to worry about topping it off as soon, but then I would not be able to use all of the extra gear and toys that come along with the calcium reactor. But, you know, seriously, my overall plan is to decrease the amount of fiddling around I have to do with my tank and to enjoy it more. I don't want to become too detached from my tank to the point that I'm dependent on too much automation and something happened as a result of me being too laid back with the system. But... I'm enjoying what I'm seeing so far since some of my corals seem to be coming back a bit and to have more life with coloration since starting uh, the calcium reactor and I'm achieving a bit more stable parameters. I recently sent my take water out for ICP testing and the values were better than I've had ever seen for this tank. So I'd like to thank you all for watching this video and if you like it, please remember to give it that thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Until the next video, peace.